we are going to kick off day two of this amazing summit with a keynote address on the topic of prospering Africa and investing in Africa's future. So in that case, I'd like to um, invite to the stage PK, an iconoclast, futurist, Forbes book author, and a dynamic thoughts leader. If we can give him a round of applause, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sure you had a great night for those of us who've been here since yesterday. I, I know you had fun and hopefully to be more fun today as we continue to learn, grow together, right? Um, it's always a blessing for me to speak to the promise of the African continent. I am of the view that there's so much opportunities yet untapped within our great geography and that the best of what we know about our continent is the least of what we actually have and that a lot of what is called natural resources are essentially disadvantages um, in the 2000s so there is no reason to be excited about all of the popularity and, and traction we've built within the fact of having a lot of natural resources, right? In the 2000s, to have a lot of land and gold and uranium and crude oil and all of that makes you the factory of the world. And the way that works essentially is that somebody is able to put $10 to plant cocoa in, say, Côte, Côte Abidjan or in Lagos or somewhere in the Kitty State in Nigeria. And then he spends another $10 to cultivate the cocoa and put it all together. And then he spends another $10 to um, harvest the cocoa. And then he sells the cocoa for $40. Essentially, he has invested $30 in planting the cocoa, cultivating the cocoa, and harvesting the cocoa. And then he has made a profit of $10 because he sold it for $40. And then somebody from Italy or from Belgium or somewhere in Paris is the one that bought the cocoa at $40, making a profit of $10 for the gentleman. And then the guy goes away uh, like he's gone forever, except that he's coming back. He only gave the cocoa seller a temporary idea of value to give him a consolation of a balance of power. In the real sense of time, this gentleman from Italy or from London is coming back. While he's away, the gentleman who sold the cocoa and made $10 has renewed um, his rent, probably bought a new car, um, took his kids from the school they were attending to a more expensive school, spending and enjoying his $10 basking in the euphoria of his prosperity. And then six months down the line, the gentleman from Italy or London or Belgium or Paris came back with chocolates. And those chocolates are going to be um, $60. And now, when he came back, don't forget, our friend has deep dived into his $10 profit. He doesn't really have $40 anymore. But his children and himself will have to eat that chocolate. And the moment he pays for that chocolate, he's going to pay for it on some form of credit. Because his $10 that he used to invest, the, the $10 he used to cultivate, the $10 he used to harvest, and the $10 he got for profit are all still inside the $60 that he's going to pay for chocolate. So this guy never prospered. He was given a consolation of prosperity at some point, allowed to pretend that he's okay, while his robber is going to return six months after to strip him of all he gave him and more. And the latter end of that man will be worse than his beginning. And part of that is true for gold, is true for uranium, is true for we give gold to somebody somewhere in Europe or diamonds 
we rejoice that we've sold something, they come back to sell more expensive bangles, more expensive chains, more ex expensive jewelry for the same things that we thought we, we had and the same prosperity we thought we knew. For nations with crude oil like Nigeria, the refineries are pretty much um, HIV positive. I'm sorry um, for anybody struggling with that, but assuming they can be cured. So um, the crude oil has to be taken to some other country, refined, sold back to our people um, at, of course, by far more expensive um, numbers. So the reality is that to be able to pride ourselves in natural resources just keeps us as the factory or the warehouse of the world. We now know that economies really grow with finished goods, whether tangible or intangible. Finished goods are the key to economic strength, particularly those that are authored in digital format today. And so the borderlessness that is being created in a technocracy where all ideas are governed by technology and managed by technologies, which is the character and the strength of the future. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the kind of place that Africa has to think seriously about. Today, our embarrassment is to produce what we don't consume, to consume what we don't produce. And of course, there's no individual or any economy or company that can survive on that equation. For every one pound we receive in aid, we give back 14 pounds in trade restrictions. Again, we've never been helped because favor is not free. And people get comfortable with the idea of being supported and being helped. For every degree of favor that you seek, whether you're an individual, a company, a family, or a nation, for every degree of favor that you seek, you lose a level of freedom. Whether you are aware of that loss or not, there's always an opportunity cost for the things you assume to be getting for free. Agendas are the strength of the universe. Every human being laces its value with some form of interest or agenda at different levels. And it doesn't matter what you think you are getting for free, somebody is coming back with a different angle or at a higher elevation or at a higher resolution to take back not just what you were given, but much more than you were given. And so at the end of the day, balance of power is that I have something of such intrinsic value that I can share with the world at a level that allows me to sit equally on the table, wherever that table is or whatever that table represents, right? And until we begin to think at that level and we begin to cultivate our power or curate our power on those kind of um, lines, we continue to be taken very weakly on seriously in the Committee of Nations. The joy, however, is that a bigger thing is happening in Africa, and that's our population. By, in another, you know, 50 years or 30 years or 25 years, we will see an African population running to over four or five billion people. That population, however, is people between age um, 31 and below. Most of our people are 25 and even below, right? So that is future energy. That's future power. By 2030, four things would define the universe as we know it, the whole world as we know it. It has already started since 2018. COVID came to deepen it and it's getting deeper and deeper. Number one, the fading of powers and voices as we have known. Number two, the rise of powers and voices as we are yet to know. And number three, the rise of underdogs. No name boys and girls, men and women, rising to prominence at a level unprecedented and unimaginable. This is the promise of the future. Africa is the only continent in the whole world that is getting younger every year, right? In every other geography, in every other climate, people are not dying, people are not um, procreating, and so populations are getting older and older. And like I said yesterday, by 2030, there will be more grandparents in the world than grandchildren. And there will be more products for grandparents. There will be more services for grandparents. The idea that the workforce will be filled with Gen Z is essentially, you know, a lot of naivety. 
because by 2030, you are going to have a lot of borderless work done by old people from their homes because you don't have enough young people to really occupy that workforce space that young people have occupied for years. And so what you are going to find is an incredible partnership between the old and the young. Young people providing ideas, services, products for old people, and old people also supporting the whole um, value chain of production on different levels. So it's going to be an interesting world. We're going to see improvements in healthcare, in, in, in how we'll experience daily contemporary life, bordering on how we live, how we love, how we work, how we play, and how we die. And all of these five areas pretty much represent what is called cultural shaping today. And the products and the ideas that can sit in those five areas, again, how we love, how we, how we play, how we um, work, how we live, and how we die. It doesn't matter whether it's Facebook or Twitter or you know, Instagram or TikTok or Thread. It doesn't matter, right? The, the, they are all trying to play a role in one, two, three, four, or all these five areas. And so the reality is that we are the biggest population in the world. The best place to invest in today is Africa. And the numbers say so. If you go out of your way to go check what the figures are saying, you see that the potential for growth um, is resident nowhere else but here. All our problems that we call are, are all awaiting creative innovators, um, awaiting um, adventurers, entrepreneurs who we take responsibility for the solutions that we greet those problems. And so what kind of hope do we have as a people? I think somewhere by 2050, if I'm correct, there will be more black people um, working than white people living. And, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not against anyone or trying to be sentimental on race, but the idea is that we are procreating faster, even though we are supposed to be dying more than any other you know, geography in the world with shortage of food, lack of water, all kinds of diseases and all of that. But for some reason, our procreation is incredible. We are producing babies at a pace unimaginable that far arrest whatever losses we have in body counts, right? So the, the advantages are incredible. Now, what I really think that Africa has to begin to take serious is not the government. Sadly, some, somewhere in our reality, and I don't know how we got to believe it, we just think that until governments show up, until presidents show up, you know, we really can't make significant change in our societies. And I've spoken to so many visionaries across the continent. You see that when they are really ready to, to be part of change in Africa, what they want to do is be politicians. When they are really ready to say we are ready to make a difference, what they really want to do is to be president or to be governor or to get to the legislature. That's what they really want to do. Most of them are not even interested in the legislative arm of government or in the judiciary arm of government. They all want to get into the executive arm of government. And I've spoken to some of the brightest people you could meet in Africa, right? They miss the point. And like I emphasized yesterday, I will emphasize today again, they miss the whole point. Africa doesn't need more people in politics. Politics doesn't change any country. Politicians have never changed anything. Politicians strictly are always seeking political equity. They want something that will perpetuate their own value, right? And they are always looking, up, looking out for that. What entrepreneurs have done, whether in the United States or in Britain or in Israel or in China, essentially is to be able to build ideas and represent those ideas in such a way that it aligns with the thinking of power centers everywhere. And when the people around us are able to really see, I mean, the people in politics are able to see the value of an idea for the regime that they represent or the um, administration they represent, then they invest. I don't care if it's GSM technology or it's the arrival of the internet or whatever it is. People have only been able to legislate and take decisions in, the, in favor of ideas that work for their own interests. The, how altruistic an idea is, is a silly articulation of value. 
you know, you don't sit down in a corner and say it's a nice idea. Nobody cares if it's a nice idea. Is, is it making sense to the agenda of the power custodians? And so I want to share something with the leaders today. I'm, I'm one of those people that believe very strongly that we don't need a bunch of keys to open a door. We, don't, we only need the right key, most, most, most critically, just one key. So we don't need everybody thinking straight. We don't need everybody getting the idea. There is a deposit of foolishness we have to continue to experience for wisdom to continue to have value. The one who will carry that intelligence is the choices of human beings like you and I. In this room is enough power and enough character and strength to transform this continent if we choose to, right? We don't need everybody getting it. We don't need everybody seeing. The poor you will always have. The fool you will always have. Evil is a constant. Darkness is a reality. I mean, there's nothing that we can do about those things. But on the parallel side, optimism is free. Faith is free. You know, enthusiasm is free. Dreaming costs nothing. So we all have the, as much freedom for light as we have for darkness. And so a new type of thinking, though, has to come to the table. And part of that is to learn to take a stake in the options. And I want to challenge you to stretch your mind and think seriously about the options available in the world and how much stake you can take in that. And by that, I mean that there are only three people in the world at any point in time. There are only three people. The first person or the first group of people are those called the masses. They are the people you see every day. They are all over the place. They are all over the, all over the world. You see them every day. They are the weakest group of people you could, re, re, you could relate with. Most of the time, soulless. Most of the time, you know, lifeless on many levels. And I'm not saying that to be condescending. It's just the reality that whether we like it or not, they are a group of people otherwise called the masses. They are the ones you see every day as you go about your business and you express yourself. You'll be shocked that one of us here or two of us here or some of us here may be amongst the masses. It's the weakest environment to represent the human condition. Part of what you must do as much as you can, as fast as you can, is to get yourself out of that block called the masses, right? Otherwise, your soul will be around. It will never be present. You will be doing enough to impress yourself, your small family, and the people who believe you in your neighborhood. You will never do enough to unlock gratitude in the universe and in the world. For you to be that present and for society to know that you are here and for the world to document you in its history and to recognize you as a force, you will have to intentionally take yourself out of that group called the majority. Now, if you stretch further, you now have the second group of people, those you see when they are revealed. And I say this sadly, that is where most people who are thinking want to be. Who are those people you see when they are revealed, when they are appointed, when they are chosen, when they are elected? CEOs, um, um, public um, office holders, um, um, come on now, um, entertainers, newscasters, culture shapers as a whole, you know, um, political appointees, the people you see representing some office. Now, the people you see when they are appointed or when they are elected or when they are revealed are the ones who control the people you see every time, otherwise called the masses. So those you see when they are revealed, when they are appointed, control those you see every time. But there's another group of people, the people you don't see at all. You see, the people you see every day at the masses, the people you see when they are shown control the people you see every day, but I see a group of people you never see. They control the people you see when they are appointed. And they are the guys that are the game changers. They are the real people to see and to be part of. Now, let me tell you how that protocol works very quickly. So it, it used to happen that choices is the machination for controlling people. So when, whether you call it slave trade or you call it um, colonialism or whatever you call it, it is all an attempt to control human choices. Now listen to this. The human being is incapable of enduring known manipulation. No human being is capable of enduring it. If you want to manipulate a human being, you have to do it reverse. You have to do it from the back with some form of virus. He must not know, she must not know you are trying to manipulate him. The day he finds out is the day his rebellion begins. 
And if you really have to manipulate him, you have to do it covertly, um, um, intelligently enough for him not to know. So when slave trade came, we didn't figure it out. He was trying to control our choices, tell us what to do, how to do it, who to do it with, where to go, where not to go. And whether you call it slavery or being a victim or being a slave, they mean the same thing. A slave, a victim, and a poor person are all human beings who are incapable of controlling their necessary deal human experiences. The moment you have lost control of your necessary deal human experiences, you are now either poor or you are a slave or you are a victim. When you are truly free, it is that you can, by your own choice, manipulate, control, stretch, or distretch your um, necessary deal human experiences. So you find that when colonialism came, when slave trade came, all it was doing was telling us what to do, how to do it. We found out. At the moment we found out, we rejected it. And then slave trade became colonialism. Doing the same thing, telling us what to do, controlling our choice, where to go, where not to go. We found out, we rejected it again. Then it morphed into, say, appetite. And then we found out and we rejected it again. It morphed into military rule across the continent. We found out, we rejected it, and we've continued to reject everything. And then some people have sat down, maybe they didn't meet, but I know there is some form of consensus, tangible or intangible, to say, hmm, we can't continue to control their choices. Because every time we try to control their choices, they find out and it morphs into some type of rebellion that set them free. What can we do now to perpetuate their slavery? Mm, come on, we got it. What to do is to actually give them control over their choices as opposed to trying to control those choices. Are we together? So what we began to do was um, employ religious leaders, pastors, imams, influencers, public old office holders, entrepreneurs who shape culture, bring everybody together and remind them that their choice is their greatest power and encourage them to teach their constituencies, husbands, wife, tell your children, spiritual leaders, tell your members, pastors, tell your members, imams, uh, tell your members, teachers, tell your students, tell them nobody should control their choices. Let them know their choices is their greatest power. Let them know that their strength really is to never allow any human being control their choices. Fight for your choices. Rather die than allow anyone control your choices. For example, votes. Don't sell your votes. Make sure nobody takes your vote from you. Your vote is your greatest power. Die for that vote if you have to, but let nobody control it. Except that we give you control over your choices, but we take our own stake in the options. Now, by the time we take our stake in the options, we arrest your power to choose. What is your power to choose if you have to choose one of three fools? Your power to choose is useless. Even when you are told to protect your vote and to teach you all the skills of knowing how to vote, you now know how to vote, except that you missed the line, which is the emergence of the options. The people who determine how the options emerge are the real power centers. They are not partisan. They take a stake in all the options. So whether you choose A, B, or C, you are choosing us. You see what I'm saying? So what they really do is to take a seat amongst the emergence of the options. They do it every day. You say, I prefer Facebook. Sorry, I hate Facebook. It's everybody's platform. I'd rather sit on Instagram. Well, you are still buying one person, Mark Zuckerberg. Somebody says, well, I don't like Toyota. It's everybody's game. I'd rather drive a Lexus. Well, you are paying the same company. Somebody says, well, puke milk is useless. It's, puke milk is the milk in Nigeria. I will never sit with three crowns. Three crowns, everybody's milk. That is milk of the poor. Well, whether you buy three crowns or you buy puke milk, you are paying the same company. Some people say Go TV is cheap. You have the cheapest programs on Go TV. I'll pay for DSTV. That's the premium. Whether Go TV or DSTV, you are paying the same companies. People are smart. The idea is take a stake in the wildness of their own imaginations. It doesn't matter how powerful they think, take a stake in all the available options, right? But do better, be the one evolving the options. So in an election, for example, the masses, the TV, the programs, the campaigns, teach the masses to protect their votes. The real power blocks don't care what you vote for. They go take a stake in how the options emerge. So party administration is by far superior to the whole idea of voting 
because party administration is where the candidates emerge from. What is the power of your choice when you are going to make a choice between three dummies, right? And so the choices and how they emerge is the power area. So I never talk to young people to go learn how to vote. I tell them, learn how to engage, learn how to sit in the rooms, learn how to be part of how the options emerge, because that is where the real game changing happens from. Are we on the same page? And so you have to ask yourself, whatever industry you play in, I've seen a lot of commitment to teach entrepreneurs. I've seen a lot of commitment to teach innovators, to help you know, non-profits people, to talk to people in government. Listen, all of those things are very shadow way of experiencing change. Because at the end of the day, something more intrinsic, non-partisan, is working as a virus, as a program beneath all that you see, and running the options that you have. And when you use all your power to choose, you are only choosing one of the options that people intelligently curate. Are we there? So when you look for your seat, you don't look for your seat amongst, sorry, with your choices. You first of all seek your seat in how the options emerge. Now, how does that affect the people in this room? The way it affects the people in this room is to tell yourself, you know, you can be prosperous as an entrepreneur or you can be a culture shaper. To really shape culture, you have to go beyond the profits that come to you. But to ask yourself that the products you are selling, how much power does it give you within the culture, right? So in the United States, for example, Hollywood will do more job, like I said yesterday, more job than the U.S. military would do, right? Pentagon, um, Washington, 10 Downing Street, Kremlin, wherever you think, those places are powerful, but one Hollywood trumps all of them. Because Hollywood can touch more minds, more brains, more people than 10 Downing Street can ever touch, than the White House can ever touch. Are we on the same page? So I believe very strongly that the promise of Africa is not in the government offices. They themselves are part of the options that need to be curated. And what we need to do is to take what I call adventure capital. The idea that from one spot, if we think intelligently enough, we can birth so much options that people think they are dreaming about. How beautiful will it be for people to think they are creating when actually you have rented a space in their head and creating on their behalf, but making them feel that they are the ones creating it? That's the best way to perpetuate your slavery so that you don't ever protest because you think you are in charge of everything, yet we are in charge of everything through the options that we create. And so that is where the game changing is going to come from. So how does that work in this equation? Yesterday, if you were here in my keynote, I made a very strong argument for the place of the diaspora. The idea that nations have never grown, the biggest ideas in the world have not emerged without an intelligent contribution of the diaspora. The argument that we have to get people in diaspora to come home, like a lot of that has been done in Ghana, you know, is, I'm sorry to say, very weak. We don't need people coming home. We need ideas coming home. And the movement of ideas is the strength of change, right? Bill Gates doesn't live in Africa, but Microsoft is everywhere. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't live in Africa, but Microsoft, but Facebook is everywhere. Meta is everywhere. Apple, um, Steve Jobs never lived in Africa. Um, 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 Tim Cook doesn't live in Africa. But guess what? The whole of Apple phones and Mac and all of that are all over the continent. The movement of the body is luxury. The movement of ideas is more seamless, it's more transferable, it's more borderless. And that is where we have to camp. And as I close, the challenge is to be able to say to ourselves, how do we birth those kind of ideas? How do we run ideas that actually practically put politics out of the game and allow politicians to think they are making decisions? when actually we are making the decisions for them. That's adventure capital. We take a stake in all the options, we begin to build ideas that shape culture, that impact on how we live, how we love, how we share, how we, how we play, how we die, and begin to put those options before the government, aligning it with their own agenda. And it's only a matter of time because you begin to see the biggest force that has ever come out of Africa, our youth, our population, with ideas capable of stretching across the world, attracting purchasing power from everywhere, bringing it to headquarters in, in Lagos or in Banjul or in Conakry or in Nairobi. That is how these things will work, or in Dakar or in Johannesburg or here in Accra. 
the idea is that we can do much more than we think possible if we lean into the basic gifts that God has given mankind, the human brain, the human emotions, right? All of those things are the tools people control to make decisions, to create power, and to create meaning across the world. I do pray that what I've said is not very complex. I do hope that the visionaries in this room can begin to take that deeper and begin to ask ourselves questions like, so what does that mean for me? What does that mean for the business that I do? What does that mean for the interests that I have embraced? What does that mean for how I define change? Because ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not, like I said yesterday, and like we all agree, nobody's going to give us what we deserve. We are going to get what we negotiate and what we negotiate intentionally. And so I'm interested in how powers emerge. I'm interested in how we curate these type of things. Now, somebody said we need to end white domination in the world and promote black, black, black domination. And I said, that is prejudice. That is us running away um, from the reality of what has happened in our history and trying to replicate another form of it. We don't need virgins in the world. Whatever has happened to history has happened. Today, we don't need to upset anything. We don't even need to revenge anything. We just need to communicate that we can coexist, but on balance of power. And that comes from ideas, that comes from products, that comes from services. And when we produce at that level, we will be taken seriously in the community of nations where nobody needs to lose for us to gain. And nobody needs to gain because they can identify our own weakness and losses. We can all gain. It's called win-win. And on that table, power centers will be comfortable to engage, give you a space on that table because you are not there to disrupt or to really challenge anything. You are just there to ask for what is rightfully yours. Right? God bless you. And I hope this sets a stage for the further discussions we are going to have here. Do enjoy the program and have a beautiful time. Thank you. I think PK actually deserves another round of applause. Thank you so much for those incredible sentiments, especially the, um, I guess, the importance of us all being culture shapers and the importance of the movement of ideas.